Chapter 12. One of these days, I'm going to tell you I told you so. Mr. Young turned to me while pouring a soda into a cup of ice. What do you mean by that? I ask with a little sarcasm in my voice. I roll my eyes slightly. Well, for starters, I see you out there with Adam and them assholes. Mark my words, the last thing you need to do is, is get involved with them there degenerates. I just met those guys today. You must not remember when I pointed them guys out to you, he says. He continues without letting me answer him. Don't get in that damn car if you ever want to make it off this mountain alive. If you don't listen to me, one of these days, I'm going to tell you I told you so. My feelings tell me that Mr. Young is likely correct in his analysis, as well as his advice. A scolding from him is how my first night at Big Sandy started. Tonight is another night where his early to bed rule is out the window. It is clear that he despises Adam along with the rest of the car. He tells me that they all just came to Big Sandy from a prison in Texas and that Stevie, Adam, and the rest of the crew think they are tough. If they think they are going to run this prison, Chad, they are sadly mistaken. Why do you despise them so much? Well, for starters, they weren't here for a week before that Dennis and his buddy Ronnie beat up my old cellmate. What did they do that for? I ask with intent curiosity. For no goddamn reason, he says with anger in his voice. He sat in a seat he has been sitting in inside the mess hall that they came here and claimed. They think they own those seats now. Them seats belong to Obama and Eric Holder, not the Boston, New York damn East Coast car, or whoever they claim to be. I smile pondering his statement about Eric Holder. Since he is the Attorney General, maybe he owns the seats after all. He is in charge of the Justice Department and the federal prison system. If Mr. Young told the car that Eric Holder owned those seats, they would likely beat him up as well. More than half the guys in the car probably do not even know who Eric Holder is in the first place. But Mr. Young has no real power or say-so. They would kick his ass, old or not, if he expressed his opinion to anyone in the car. Let me tell you this, young man. I have seen guys just like them a lot in this here prison. They don't last long. Those boys will be in more shit than planters got peanuts. This was the last thing I wanted to hear given my recent decision to join the car. I am deeply bothered by the fact that I pledge my allegiance to this car. With everything Mr. Young has told me, I cannot possibly tell him what I did. If I did, he would surely go off like a runaway train. Keeping this to myself seems like the better option. I feel like a small child when the child knows he has done something wrong. Anxiety, confusion, and stupidity mix. As Mr. Young talks, it feels like I am being scolded by my father, and I'm trying to hide the shame of a bad choice. God only knows what I have gotten myself into. Jumping in headfirst was a mistake on my part, and deep inside, I know it. As I drift off to sleep, I find myself anticipating my future here at Big Sandy and wondering whether Mr. Young is going to tell me he told me so. The morning arrives with the sun bouncing brightly off the window, illuminating the cell. Mr. Young rolls out of bed. I lay there silently making excuses to myself, contemplating the many bad decisions I've made over the course of my young life. Joining this car triggered regrets. Feeling sorry for myself will accomplish nothing. I shake the thoughts from my conscious mind and slide out of bed to begin my day. At breakfast, I find myself with my newly acquainted car members. Reality sets in quickly. Most of these men are living in a fantasy land. It is apparent we are all caught in some phony prison movie where the script is already written. I ponder that thought. There is a fake bravado of being a tough guy. Many men pretend to be something they are not. It becomes obvious that many prisoners are faking it to make it. Behind these walls, hardened men seem to create their own problems. To make trouble with other prisoners over things that would be trivial in society. It seems absurd that a person would want to create a hostile environment for themselves. An environment riddled with violence. But that is what happens on this side of the razor wire. There are men here who are truly barbaric, hateful, and cold-hearted. But many of the guys are simply pretending. In order to survive, you have to play the prison game the way it exists. A game in which the rules change daily. Joining the car was the first move in the prison game for me. When Dennis was recruiting me, he told me my next move had to be my best move. Because I was a younger white guy from New York, there really was no choice. Had I refused the offer, they would have sent missiles to attack me. This is something I would later learn. There is no choice with the East Coast car. The only way you leave is as a victim of violence. In convict code, this is called beating someone off the yard. Once a group of prisoners assault a prisoner, that prisoner is no longer safe in population. The Bureau of Prisons will then transfer that prisoner to another prison to start anew. At breakfast, I meet a guy named Ace. He is the shot caller for the Ohio White Independent Car. 
Ace and his comrades have an alliance with Arkar. Like Stevie, he has a hatred for white gang members. Arrogance rolls off him as he tells me his story. For Ace, his future holds nothing but this crazy world. He was in his 20s when he was sentenced to over 200 years for robbing banks. His future holds nothing but anguish and despair. You can almost see it in his eyes when he speaks. For him, the free world was like the Titanic, sunk on that cold night. Like Stevie, he latches onto the car. It's all he has left. Having the keys to the Ohio car is his safe haven. That safe haven does not last long for Ace at Big Sandy. Months later, members of his own car find him to have committed one of the ultimate prison sins. Some time ago, Ace was put in the special housing unit, SHU, pronounced SHU, for assaulting another prisoner. While in the SHU, he accepted a black prisoner from Ohio as his cellmate. Once Ace served his time in the shoe, he was returned to general population. A plot has been put into place to beat him off the yard. The yard seems still. Most people know what is going to happen, or at least they thought they knew. Two young white convicts from Ohio are stalking Ace. A tall white kid named Slim. The other a stocky blonde with tattoos on his face. Ace has his back to the two villains and is engaged in a heated verbal dispute with another Ohio prisoner. Slim sneaks up behind him and swings for the fences. Slim's first punch crunches with the impact, landing to the side of Ace's face. Tattoo Face begins to swing wild, glancing blows as Ace ducks, dodges, and pulls a prison shank from his waist. Tattoo Face sees the knife and bolts from the scene, leaving Slim to his demise. Ace is stabbing Slim. The two bodies lock up and fall to the ground. Slim is on the bottom, his hands flailing as Ace mounts him. The sirens blare out. The loudspeaker instructs everyone to get on the ground. A warning shot reverberates off the concrete walls as Ace slashes downward with his sharpened bone crusher. Another warning shot does not deter the onslaught of violence. Slim fights for his life. The correctional officer in the gun tower sets his sights at center mass. Once his target is set, he pulls the trigger sending the bullet from an AR-15 assault rifle into Ace's body. Immediate impact. Ace topples over the lanyard holding his shank in place. Slim scrambles to his feet sucking in air. He darts from the area where he almost lost his life. Confusion engulfs the yard as panic sets in among both staff and convicts. Seeing a shot radiates the reality that losing your life is a real possibility. It is not going to always be warning shots. Staff members are coming from everywhere. Medical personnel with red medical bags rush to Ace and roll him over onto his back. One nurse seems to be brushing dirt off what looks like his intestines seeped out of the gaping hole in his stomach. Ace is staring into the sky as if he sees Satan's angels coming to take him to purgatory. The nurse is pushing his intestines back into his body. It is too late for Ace. His blood will forever be left on the razor wire here at Big Sandy. Another inmate met his maker on the prison yard. Violence has claimed Ace's life. His car. The car that he held on to so dearly was his demise in the end. His 200-year sentence began and ended behind these gloomy concrete walls. Ace is loaded on a stretcher. The wind dances through the razor wire. 19% of all male inmates in the U.S. prisons say they have been physically assaulted by another inmate. Big Sandy is known for housing some high-profile inmates. The prison houses a significant portion of the people convicted of crimes in the Washington, D.C. area. The National Capital Revitalization Self-Government Improvement Act of 1997 gave the Federal Bureau of Prisons custody of sentenced D.C. felons. About 33% of the inmates here at Big Sandy have been convicted of D.C. crimes. The D.C. car is the biggest car at the prison. When a car has numbers, they wield the power on this side of the razor wire. While many men here are pretending, some have learned to become violent. Others are simply brutal. October and November seem to be the months when Satan hovers over the prison. In October 2006, 33-year-old Terrell Johnson, serving a sentence for armed bank robbery, stabbed fellow prisoner, Kelvin Spite in the neck with a bone crusher. Spite, like Ace, met his maker in Inez, Kentucky. Two years later, Johnson pleaded guilty to a charge of second-degree murder and was sentenced to a further 26 years in prison, 14 years less than my 40-year term for a nonviolent drug crime. When I hear Johnson's sentence come across my radio, I simply shake my head. Less than a month after Spite's murder, Shimoni Peterson met his end after a brutal beating by Daryl Milburn and Dwayne Gravely. Milburn, Gravely, and Daron Crawford were all living in a shoe cell designed for two. On November 12, 2006, a corrections officer asked if they would accept a forced cellmate. 
That fourth man was Shimoni Peterson. Gravely, a senior member of the Bloods in Milburn, decided to accept Peterson as a cellmate, but for only one reason. They wanted blood. Gravely believed Peterson had snitched on the Bloods, and snitching comes with severe consequences. Soon after Peterson entered the cell, Milburn put a t-shirt over his mouth and suffocated him while Gravely beat him. Peterson was found dead the next morning. The trio kept the dead body in the cell with them all night while they plotted how to explain his death. Violence is expected here by both staff and inmates. On November 4, 2007, extreme violence erupted again when Eric Emard repeatedly stabbed his cellmate in the neck with a prison-made knife. After the assault, Emard told staff that he had intended to kill his cellmate. His cellmate required surgery and hospitalization. Emerd's streak of violence did not end with the stabbing of his cellmate. That was just the beginning. While he was being prepared for transportation to a federal court to answer for the stabbing, he stabbed two correctional officers with a sharp weapon he fashioned from plexiglass. Prisoner Stephen Michael Reed, angry at his unit manager, decided to throw scalding hot water in his face. The unit manager ran out of the unit with first and second degree burns to his face, neck, and chest. Reed's transgressions came with an additional 20-year sentence from a federal judge in Kentucky. October 21, 2008. Another federal prisoner from the New York area stabbed the prison guard over 10 times in the head, back, and arm with a prison-made weapon. In November 2008, Big Sandy prisoner Aaron Pike was stabbed by white gang members over 30 times. Pike was stabbed in the face, hands, and back. When the carnage had come to an end, both hands were broken, both lungs were punctured, and Pike was mercy flighted, fighting for his life. Miraculously, doctors were able to save him. Death is a constant at Big Sandy. 2009 was rung in with the murder of Vincent Earl Smith Jr., a DC prisoner. John Travis Milner, who had been recently transferred to Big Sandy from USP Lee in Virginia for stabbing another prisoner, decided to stab his cellmate with a prison-made ice pick before strangling Smith Jr. to death. Milner was at Big Sandy serving a life sentence for killing 68-year-old church trustee Walter Coates in a random shooting. Seeking the death penalty for prison killings is a rarity, but in 2013, the Justice Department was weighing whether to seek his execution. J.M. Steps Eden was being transferred into humanity's hell, day after day, year after year. The violence, the death, the fear will never end until Big Sandy ceases to exist. With each assault, every murder, I know my life is on the line. I stare at the sun sparkling off the razor wire, wondering if my blood too will be left here. Only time will tell. Chapter 13 Smoking weed and bamboo, sipping on private stock. Way back, when I had the red and black lumberjack with the hat to match. Remember, rapping Duke? Do ha, do ha. You never thought that hip hop would take it this far. Now I'm in the limelight, cause I rhyme tight. Time to get paid, blow up like the world trade. Born sinner, the opposite of a winner. Remember when I used to eat sardines for dinner? Peace to Ron G, Brucey e. B, Kid Capri, Funk Master Flex, Love Bug, Star Ski. I'm blowing up like you thought I would. Call the crib, same number, same hood. It's all good. And if you don't know, now you know, nigga. You know very well who you are. Your father's a vicious crackhead, Booper ragged as we sat at his grandmother's table bagging up the first ounce of cocaine we ever bought. Juicy was playing on the floor model. Fuck you, your mother's a crackhead too, I replied. We both laugh in our ignorance. My heart flutters from the nervousness and excitement that comes with bagging up cocaine. I sit at the front table so I can see the front door in case someone tries to come in and take our hard-earned product. Within days, we went from a fake product to a real ounce of cocaine. Half for Booper, half for me. Two glass plates sat in front of us. We took the razor blades to the shiny rocks. As I chopped the rocks into smaller dosages, I thought about all the money I wanted to make. The new starter jacket I would buy, and the matching pair of brand new Bo Jacksons. Money would help me escape my loneliness. It would help me buy the happiness I desired. The possibility that I could lose my life over $10 bags of cocaine was never even considered. Losing my drugs was impossible. I was starting my rise to the top. In my stupidity, I never even thought that prison was possible. I was too smart to get caught, or so I thought. Once our product was packaged, we headed out to a corner where there was a house that people were selling their own drugs from. Me and Booper had been out there stealing their customers for days. When one of the addicts would pull up, we would call them before they went to the door. Most of them would come to us, but some of the loyalists went to the door. 
It was not long before one of the loyalists told the guy on the other side of the door what we were doing. That's when Cooley came out of the door with a pistol in his hand. You bitch-ass motherfuckers stealing my customers? He yelled as he fired a shot in the air. We ran through the snow, hopping fences, racing back to the safe confines of Booper's Grambler's house and the floor model. Sitting in front of the floor model, we contemplated our next move. I knew I wanted that starter jacket and new Nikes, but now the plans had to change. If we were to continue in this business, I knew we both needed a gun. We need pistols, Booper. That's what we need. Two burners, man. Yeah, we ain't letting his bitch ass run us off. Those are our customers now, Booper replied. The street hustling life was taking off. Full throttle. For the meantime, we are going to sell cocaine to Booper's uncle's customers. Don't let him hold you down. Reach for the stars. You had a goal, but not that many. Because you the only one. I fell asleep on Booper's couch, smiling, dreaming about reaching the stars like Biggie said. Chapter 14 The morning is new, with the sun shining bright. I tuck my commissary items away and put my radio in my pocket. I contemplate going outside. Perhaps I should stay inside. Part of me wants to stay inside to keep watch over my locker. The other part of me wants to go to the yard to taste the fresh air. Fresh air is a small thing to most, but I look forward to it. The stale air contaminated with cigarette smoke and the dirty smell of sweat pushes me towards the hallway. I convince myself that my commissary will still be in my locker when I return, but I really have no idea if it will be. I am unsure if people are stealing here. Outside, I have to pass through a metal detector. The detector is not plugged in. The correctional officer assigned to man the machine and ensure no inmates take bone crushers or steal to the yard is oblivious to the fact that there is no power. He's more concerned with the conversation he is engaged in with a petite nurse. The conversation might be his way of avoiding a confrontation with any convicts transporting weapons to the yard. One man after another passes through the detector without a single beep. How many men have weapons on them is anyone's guess. The handball court seems to be calling me. When I was younger, I spent some of my summers playing the game on the back wall of my middle school. Two Mexican guys I came on the bus with are playing one-on-one. -on -one. Both are Serenos, or Southsiders, as they are sometimes called. They are soldiers for the Mexican Mafia. Both the Serenos and the Mexican Mafia are highly respected by the staff and convicts alike. They are known behind these walls, as well as outside of them, as being a serious gang that has no qualms about using serious violence to meet whatever objectives their gang has. The Mexican Mafia was first formed in the 1950s with a group of 13 Mexican inmates at a prison in California. Those 13 men banded together to protect one another from other prisoners at the facility. In an attempt to squash the newly formed gang, prison authorities began sending the original members to other prisons. Rather than squashing the gang, what authorities did allowed the founders of the gang to recruit new members at other prisons, strengthening the gang. Once members were released from prison, the gang flourished in the free world, gaining even more strength and a stronger reputation. All Serenios aspire to become Mexican Mafia members someday, so they can get a black hand tattooed on their chest with an M in the middle. Such a tattoo is a badge of honor, and with it comes power and prestige in the criminal world. When it comes to Mexican gangs, the Mexican Mafia is at the top of the food chain. A 1992 movie titled American Me focused on the formation of the Mexican Mafia, or the La M A, as it's also known. Another movie, Blood In, Blood Out, was loosely based on the gang architects, one of whom was Peg Leg Morgan, a white man who adopted the Mexican way of life. Not happy about the organization being put on display, the Mexican Mafia had two of the consultants on the American Me movie killed. Charles Charlie Brown Marquez and Anna Lizarraga were both shot to death. No one is off limits when the gang feels disrespected. No one. Sad Boy and Droopy invite me to play. Had I been black, they would have never made the invite. The Serenos have a strict code in here. They stay away from doing business or associating with blacks as much as they can. Almost everyone in the prison has a name other than their real name. Sad Boy does not look sad, yet this is what people call him. Droopy, on the other hand, has a droopy kind of look. There are many characters in here, from half-dead to droopy. People from all over the country now confined in this desolate place. Playing handball takes me out of prison. It is another activity in here that puts me in a pleasant place from my past. For the moment, I am on the back wall of my middle school with two friends. Droopy becomes Freddy. Sad boy is Andy. I trick myself. 
When I do this, I am able to leave prison. Leaving takes away the pain of my reality. Today is not today, at least not right now. Adam is standing off to the side of the court. I hadn't noticed him until now. When the ball goes out of play, he tells me he needs to talk to me after the game. For some reason, him wanting to talk to me angers me. Maybe it's because talking to him pulls me from middle school back into prison. After the game, I shake hands with the Serenios, thank them for inviting me to play, and walk toward Adam. Adam extends his hand to shake mine. What's up, Chad? Nothing much. What's up with you? Aw, oh, man, just out here strolling. Notice you playing handball with the Mexicans. It's all right, bro, to play handball with the Mexicans, but you should try to find some white dudes to play with. Some guys in the car. He says this looking into the distance behind his sunglasses. I am not really on that racist shit, I respond. Nah, man, me either, bro. It's just a better policy. Sometimes sports can get heated, competitive at times, and can lead to problems. One problem with another race could cause us all problems. I nod in agreement, but my anger builds. He continues, I ain't trying to do your time, bro. Just trying to help you. Just a better policy to do things with your own. You're new to prison, Chad, and there are a lot of things you're going to learn. Most of them you won't like, but some of these policies might save your life. Those Mexicans would kill you without a second thought, trust me. To a certain extent, Adam might be right, but being from New York, I had friends that were black, white, and Hispanic. New York is filled with people of different cultures, races, and languages. My best friend and co-defendant was of mixed race, Mexican and Irish. Now my way of thinking has to change. Prison, or Big Sandy, is a brand new beast, one I am unfamiliar with. This prison shit is crazy, I say. I don't make the prison rules or politics. I just follow them, Chad. It's better for all of us that way. It's all good, I agree. Adam and I shake hands parting ways. Once back at the country cottage, as I have been referring to my cell given all of Mr. Young's knickknacks that adorn our housing area, I open my locker. My commissary items are still there. Mr. Young's angry look prompts me to initiate a conversation. What's up, Mr. Young? I ask. You just ain't going to listen, are you, boy? He snarks. I seen you out there with them guys again. What guys? Oh, don't play stupid with me, young man. What the hell do you mean, I ask? You was out there hanging out with that long hair fella. What the hell's his name? Adam. Yeah, and he ain't nothing but trouble. I was playing handball and he wanted to talk to me. I tried to explain, but it's useless. I'm going to tell you I told you so when something bad happens with you. And if you're in the hole and I don't get to see you, you just remember what old man Mr. Young told you. There's an overwhelming feeling that floods my inner self, telling me that the old man is probably going to be correct with his advice. Mr. Young's scolding makes me feel like a kid. He has been here a lot longer than me, and I'm sure he knows more than me. Mr. Young is wise in both years and prison experience. Feeling like I still have to explain myself, I respond. Mr. Young, I'm just trying to be cool with everyone. I ain't trying to offend no one. Well, for your sake... Hopefully you won't be cooling off in the morgue with a toe tag on for messing with those scumbags, he says, raising his voice a little. Hopefully not. Yeah, what would your mother say if she got that phone call, he asks. Look, you're an old man, and I'm not going to argue with you or talk about this bullshit. Think about your mama before you make a bad choice, he hollers out to me as I walk out of the cell. I don't know if I am mad at Mr. Young or at myself for making foolish decisions. The toe tag comment coupled with the phone call to my mother's statement, have my insides in an uproar. Standing against the wall, I pretend to watch television while I envision a morgue. There I am. I'm looking at myself on a cold slab of stainless steel with a toe tag and stab wounds. My mother crying with a phone to her ear. The thought of dying in this place is real. My mother getting the call hurts me more than the dying part. If it were not for my mother, maybe the dying part might be better than serving a 40-year sentence. Avoiding Mr. Young for the rest of the day is easy, but I cannot escape being locked in the cell at night with him. Once the doors lock, he begins. Chad, I don't mean to be hard on you, and this is prison. I ain't supposed to be in no one's business, but you being young and new to prison, I'm trying to help you. Nah, I understand. There is no reason for me to argue with Mr. Young or to make excuses. I know he is right about everything he told me. I am telling you this prison is not like any other prison you ever seen, Chad. As I lay in my bed listening to Mr. Young, I find it hard to believe that my life has been reduced to living in a locked concrete bunker with another man three times my age and a toilet. 
wondering if my mother might get that call. Chapter 15. Living the street life comes with consequences. For me, those consequences came with a severe sentence and my placement in a prison where my life could be taken at any moment. Feeling the need to be alone with my thoughts, I opt for the yard this morning. Mornings are the one time where there is peace here at Big Sandy, as most of the convicts are required to be at their jobs. Being new, no job assignment has been made for me, and with a 40-year prison term, a job is the last thing I want. Guys in here work eight-hour days, five days a week, for about $20 a month, on average. For some convicts, jobs pass the day. I would rather pass my day playing handball or walking the track. My hope is that today will be better than yesterday. Some of my uneasy tension has become a bit suppressed with the realization that this is my life. Every morsel of Big Sandy is a part of my life now. From the violence to the razor wire, it is all part of me. I earned it according to my sentencing judge. Forty years in Big Sandy was sufficient for my nonviolent drug conviction. Some days I feel like I don't give a fuck about anything. It is usually the days when I replay my sentencing day. The day when my mother disappeared and left me wondering if I would ever see her again. Reality is, I have to be here. Making the best of it is the only option. There are more people on the yard today than usual. My peaceful walk alone with my thoughts fade quickly as I easily recognize that there is tension on the yard. The tension is so thick you can cut through it with a knife. Already my prison instincts are coming to fruition. One of the most important tools I have learned within the first few days of being here is that I must be observant. Being able to recognize everything going on around me is one key to surviving in this hellhole. Scanning the yard like a hawk soaring over an open field looking for prey, I notice Mexican prisoners forming small groups around the yard. This world I now live in is a dog-eat-dog -dog world filled with lions and hyenas with very few zebras. Deep discussions are being had between the shot caller for the Serenios and some of his soldiers. My secret hope is that whatever problem is afoot has nothing to do with the whites and Mexicans. There are about 20 white convicts on the yard, including me, compared to at least 75 Mexicans. We would get slaughtered. Thinking back to what Adam told me about the Serenios, I know every one of them is likely armed with a shank. This thought convinces me that as much as I might not want a knife, it may very well be time to get one and keep it on me at all times. Being here in Big Sandy, I know now that I would rather get caught with it than not with it. As the thought filters through my subconscious, I find out the problem with the Serenios has nothing to do with the whites when a large Mexican soldier grabs one of his comrades from behind in a chokehold. The victim is another Sereno named Noki, who also lives in the same unit I am housed in. More Serenios circle Noki. They deliver punches to his head, face, and body. Before long, he is rendered unconscious. The large Mexican lets Noki's limp body fall aimlessly to the ground. Other people join the fray, dishing out powerful kicks to Noki's head and body. One of the kicks wakes Noki from his comatose state. Using the nearby fence, his fingers lock onto the shiny metal fence as he pulls his body up. Finding his feet, he stumbles on a large push broom. Fighting for his life, he begins to swing the broom like Barry Bonds on steroids, chasing the home run record. Come on, puto! Noki screams like a wild animal as the warm blood runs down his face. One of the soldiers rushes in, swinging wildly. Noki's swing connects perfectly with the side of the combatant's head. Watching the first guy fall sends Noki into a raging fury. He backs up to the fence yelling profanities in Spanish. His swinging intensifies in barbaric nature. Four men rush at him at the same time. The broom connects with the side of one of the attackers. This slows Noki down. The others pounce on him like mountain lions on a fawn. The alarm finally goes off, ordering everyone to the ground. Most of the prisoners comply, but not the combatants. Once again, Noki is on the ground. The broom is now being used on him. Both Spanish and English are blaring out of the speaker, ordering all the prisoners to the ground when the first gunshot rings out, warning the soldiers that live rounds will be coming if the brutal assault does not cease. Bang! Bang! I feel an explosion. Officers circle the Serenios. Small black balls sail through the air, hitting everyone in the vicinity. One man screams. I look up, shielding my eyes. I think he is shot. But no. Concussion grenades are being deployed to break up the melee. Another one explodes and I cover my head with my arms. Warning shots ring out again from the guard towers. Officers enter the gladiator pit, tackling the men to the ground with no remorse. 
I envision some old clips of the 1970s Pittsburgh Steelers defense. One man is picked up and body slammed. Another grenade comes flying down from the guard tower. It explodes in the air, sending little black balls everywhere. They are ricocheting off the ground, off the handball walls, flying everywhere with no intended target. Whoever gets hit, gets hit. The balls do not discriminate. The guard towers stand over 30 feet high. Sharpshooters are stationed in each of the seven towers. I cover my head with my arms. I'm face down on the ground. My only hope is that I'm not hit by a live round if those start flying. With staff in the area, I'm probably safe though. Usually when correctional officers are in the area, the cops in the gun towers refrain from letting real bullets fly. I'm thankful that staff has arrived and that with their arrival, my chances of being accidentally shot have diminished. Had staff not arrived when they did, there was no doubt in my mind that someone would have been shot. These combatants had an order from the shot caller to complete a mission, assaulting Noki until he died or until the cops arrived to stop them. The attackers had no intention of stopping. Even the gunshots did not deter them. The threat of possible death meant nothing. In the real world, the thought of getting shot or killed would be a deterrent. In here, the real world has long been forgotten by these men. When you are in a place like this with a sentence of forever, death becomes a welcoming thought. Once everything is lost, there is nothing left to live for. There is no fear of death. A man with a life sentence has been through so many ups and downs on that long criminal justice roller coaster that no emotions remain. With sentences ranging from 30 years to life, there is nothing left that can be done to hurt the man who has been stripped of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That man sees death the same way a Muslim martyr does. The hope is that there will be something better on the other side of the rainbow, because this side has nothing but suffering, pain, and loneliness. Fuck rainbows. I don't like them no more. Many people like me are serving draconian sentences for nonviolent drug offenses. What is mind-boggling to me is that while these 40-year sentences for nonviolent drug crimes are being handed out, the average sentence in federal court for murder is 22 years. Had I killed someone, I would likely have been sentenced to 18 less years. The federal criminal justice system no longer has a parole system. When that door slams behind every prisoner with a crucial sentence, there are only two ways out of here. Winning relief in court or a body bag. Sadly, most people will leave here in a body bag. With my sentence, if I behave, I will get about five years off my term. Instead of getting out at 64 years old, I can get out at 59 years old. That truth disturbs me. With no incentive to do the right thing, Many of the men around me become vultures, living a barbaric life riddled with anger and violence on an astronomical level. Behaving yourself in prison is almost impossible because other prisoners' actions dictate your reactions. Those reactions might require a person to stab the other person. Sometimes those reactions don't leave a person any choice. The prison machine is designed in such a way that it applies oppression. It's designed so the prisoner never wins. It's designed so the prisoner always loses. Like with Noki, he was fighting for his life. Had he simply not fought back, he would certainly have died. Once he fought back, he earned a write-up for fighting. There is no such thing as self-defense in prison. Once a prisoner starts swinging, he loses 27 good conduct days on average. When Noki gets back from the hospital, he will be taken in front of a disciplinary hearing officer. That's his reward for fighting for his life. He will now have to spend 27 more days in prison where any one of those days could be his last. His gang will no longer want him after the brawl. Noki is a marked man. A man marked by one of the most vicious prison gangs in the system, the Serenios. Noki's provocation was a common one. He owed the Crips for heroin. Owing money to the blacks is not allowed by the big homie, the man who calls the shots for the gang. Noki has two yard violations. He was dealing with the blacks, and he couldn't pay his debt. In order to avoid a physical conflict with the Crips, the beating was on full public display. Hands laid, debt paid, is a common theme in here. The debt was paid with Noki's blood, kind of like Christ paying the debt of sin on the cross. In Big Sandy, the sinners keep sinning. Noki, like many before him, and many who will come after him, allowed his heroin addiction to get out of control. His tab kept riding higher with his need to get high, Knowing he could not pay never dissuaded him. The thought of getting hurt or killed did not override his hunger to let the fish swim through his veins. The heroine told him, follow me, everything is all right. Kind of like that Uncle Cracker song, follow me. 
When the Crips had enough of the false promises of payment being made, they went to Noki's shot caller. They knew that the only payment they would see would be blood, and they likely enjoyed that prospect. When assaults like the one on Noki happen, it is akin to the spectators at the old Roman gladiator pits, cheering for the victim to be finished. Most of the men here enjoy seeing a good, violent scuffle. Although they secretly pray, they are never on the receiving end. Had the Crips taken it upon themselves to assault Noki, the whole yard would have erupted like a festering volcano. It would have created a full-fledged war between the Hispanics and the Blacks. Such a war would have reached every other maximum security prison in the federal system that houses Serenios and Crips. The easiest way to settle the dispute was to punish Noki by vicious means. His death or his transfer to another facility after his physical discipline even the score. Dealing with the Blacks, owing a debt to them ensured he was ostracized from his gang. For the rest of his time in prison, he is a marked man. Another unwritten rule in here is that you never stop beating or stabbing another prisoner until either staff intervenes or you kill the person. This is how every car, group, or gang operates. One thing that I am intrigued by is why Noki's gang brothers allowed him to get so far in debt, knowing the end result was going to be an attack like this. My guess is the people who knew were getting high with him. The others had no money to pay for the heroin, but Noki had both the balls to deal with the blacks and enough swagger to convince the Crips that he had money, at least initially. The cycle of prison life is vicious, like a pack of hungry wolves in Yellowstone National Park, searching for vulnerable prey. Two hours of laying on the hard concrete causes pain to creep into the muscles of my legs. Some of the men are laying on their backs enjoying the warm summer sun. Others are talking amongst themselves. I too have changed my position to ease my discomfort. On my back now, I stare into the deep blue sky, tricking myself into believing that I can see Jesus Christ's face in the clouds. For a second, I whisper a plea for freedom to him. I blink my eyes a few times, and he's still there in the clouds. It's almost as if he is smirking at my request. I snicker at the absurdity of it, that I think I see him. Or maybe my snicker is because of the absurdity of him granting me freedom from here. Hell, he could have intervened a long time ago and put it on one of the jurors' hearts to vote to acquit me. He could have put it in all their hearts. Instead, he decided to send me to Big Sandy with a 40-year sentence so he could sit in the clouds laughing at me. Whether he is really there in the clouds or not, I throw a middle finger to the laughing cloud. Fuck you, I mouth silently. This ain't funny. Before I can say anything more, officers are ushering us up to our feet. Brushing the dirt off the front of my pants, I scan the yard. The other men are grateful that they can finally stretch their legs out. As we head back to the housing units, I look back one last time before I walk through the doorway. He is there, in the clouds again, laughing at me. Thank you.